And Lord, this night we do want to shout out your name, Lord. We want to shout out praises and proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And we thank you, Lord. We praise you for your faithfulness and love. We thank you for gathering us this night, Lord, that we might come to worship you in spirit and in truth, Father. And we pray, Lord God, that even as you have already poured out into our midst, into our gathering, Lord, you would pour out even greater a measure of your spirit that you might move and minister in and through us, Lord, and that uh, your spirit and the love of Jesus Christ might be infectious to those around us, Lord, that we may overflow with all the joy, with all the love, all the joy, all the peace, all the patience, all the gentleness, all the self-control of the fruit of your spirit, Lord. And we do thank you, Lord. We do praise you for your faithfulness and love, Lord. We pray, Lord God, a blessing upon those watching uh, by the internet feed, Lord God. And we just pray, Father, that you might move and minister as we continue to worship you now through the study of the word. We thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen and amen. Hey, God bless you guys. What a great time of worship that was. And uh, uh, we just lift our voices up to the Lord. Guys, we're going to continue on our study through the book of Exodus. And uh, if you'd like to turn there, Exodus chapter 4, I guess we'll uh, eventually be in. And uh, it's been a little bit of a, a while since we've been uh, in the Old Testament. We took a little bit of a side note uh, for a couple of weeks. But Exodus chapter 4, we did leave off a couple of weeks ago in chapter 3 of Exodus, guys. And, you know, we, we rejoice. We thank the Lord. Uh, on this last midweek service of 2020 that we can gather freely to worship him and uh, what a blessing it is uh, you know but you know as we left off in chapter 3 we saw Moses shepherding his father-in-law's flock and suddenly the Lord appeared to him you know here it was Moses was a was a uh, was one of the top dogs in the land of Egypt he he took off after a, in, uh, an encounter with some Egyptians and he really actually he killed an Egyptian, not thinking that anybody had uh, was watching him and saw him, but you know it became known that hey Moses took the life of this Egyptian citizen, and uh, he ran for his life. He ended up in a place called Midian, and he was again uh, 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 attached himself to one of the families there. His father-in-law Jethro was actually a priest in the land of Midian, and as he was shepherding his father-in-law's flock. Suddenly the Lord appeared to him in the midst of a burning bush. And, you know, we can only think that what Moses was thinking, but uh, Moses expectedly he was taken aback in fear, afraid to even look at the sight. And, you know, we can only think, we imagine that, hey, you know, a face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord or the angel of the Lord uh, would be quite uh, uh, a out of the ordinary type of incident. And how you might uh, react, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but... Uh, we noted in our Christmas study, guys, as the Lord or his messengers appeared to people before the birth of Jesus, the reaction, too, was one of fear. We, uh, we, like the priest Zacharias, as the angel of the Lord appeared to him, he was fear-filled. And, uh, and, and it was with, uh, the same with Mary, as God's messenger appeared to her as well, uh, as the shepherds. And who were like Moses, were, you know, they were tending their flock. Common with all three was the fear in their call and communication with the heavenly hosts. And, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't uh, seen any type of miraculous type of appearance or have the Lord or his angels appear to me, but I can only imagine. And I can think that, hey, God, you've been so faithful because it seems like it's the still small voice of the Lord. Uh, like Elijah, uh, the, the great fire came, the great earthquake came, the great wind came. But it was in the quiet, uh, quietness of the Lord's voice that came to him and, you know, speaking with him, Elijah, why are you here? And Elijah was running for his life at that particular time. And he was fearful of his life because people were after him. People wanted to kill him. And, uh, you know, like, like uh, the, the common thing is all these were filled with fear. God would, in Exodus 3, call Moses to a place of leadership, telling him he would lead the children of Israel out of bondage and hard labor to a land flowing with milk and honey. And whether he does that with any of us, you know, it might not be so dr uh, dramatic 
or such a big ministry, but whatever it is he calls us to. You know, I believe he's calling us to be faithful with the things he's called us to. Faithful with the little things. As we are faithful with those little things, you know, I believe God brings more and more and more. But, you know, Moses got the, you know, uh, 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 the, big, uh, the big call in his life uh, that he would lead the children out of Israel, out of Egypt, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Quite a, a scary thing for Moses, yeah? What do you think? As he must have been uh, comfortable. Here he was, you know, living in the land of Midian. Uh, uh, he was married, now married with kids, living in the safety of his father-in-law Jethro. And, you know, life was pretty good, I think, that, you know, he... Uh, he had uh, the, sh the, the comfort and the shelter and the warmth and the fellowship of a wife and kids and family. And he had a job. He helped tend the sheep for his uh, father-in-law, his father-in-law's sheep. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, as, as many of us, he quickly tries to disqualify himself before the Lord. But the Lord quickly reassures him and then goes on to identify himself to Moses as the self-existent. He said, I am who I am. And uh, that really just simply meaning he's the self-existent one. And you can kind of think about that. You can meditate on that. And you can think, wow, God, uh, you know, it's hard for us to fathom in our mi minuscule little minds that you are this self-existent God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And uh, the Lord identifies himself to Moses as, I am who I am. I am the, I am who I am, he tells Moses. And it's uh, like our Lord Jesus identifying himself to all mankind in the Gospel of John. He said that I am the bread of life and uh, I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And before Abraham was born, I am. In other words, he existed before all the things of the creation of the world and the creation of this earth. And Jesus would identify himself for us as the God I am. And uh, this is the God that has come and revealed himself to us. And, you know, I don't know how he did it with you and I. It might have been uh, going forward uh, at an altar call at church, somebody dragging you to church. It might have been the still, small voice of the Lord speaking to your heart, maybe in the midst of the night, in the darkness of the night, and uh, speaking right into your heart. Uh, I don't know how it happened, but God comes and he calls us. He places his call on our, our lives. And the Lord, uh, you know, it would lay out for Moses his plan of deliverance for the children of Israel. Moses not quite believing, not quite trusting all the Lord conveys to him, like ourselves, in these uncertain times, guys, the Lord would like to reaffirm his call on our lives. You might be shaking, you know, you might be in a bad spot. You might be in a place where the enemy is playing a lot of head games on you, or he's playing head games with people around you, or he's causing uh, things to come to shake you up. It might be your living circumstance. It might be your job. It might be a health issue. It might be a loved one. Whatever it is, he wants to, uh, he wants to reaffirm his call on our lives, no matter what is happening. He's saying, hey, come, my child. Follow after me. Come and hold on to my hand as we walk down this highway of life. Move forward with me in the things that I have for you. He wants to reaffirm his call. He wants to reassure us in times of uncertainty, guys. You know, no matter what it is, you might be thinking that, wow, you know, the bottom might fall out, or what if I get infected by this COVID, or what if my job disappears, or <clears throat> what if my living circumstances changes? And, you know, he wants to reassure us in this time of uncertainty. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And, you know, it, this uncertainty breeds fear in our minds. And the enemy, again, I'll say it, he's the master of the head games. He loves to come and lay trips on us. He loves to come and whisper his lies into our ears. I continually go back to that old cartoon that we used to watch when we were kids, where on the shoulder of Porky Pig was the devil on one shoulder whispering into his ear. Here's the lies and uh, the, the half-truths of the enemy. And, you know, God on the other, the angel of the Lord on the other shoulder, trying to say, hey, you know, uh, I'm, I want to reassure you in this time of uncertainty and fear. He, des uh, he dares to, uh, desires again to relay out for us his plans for our lives. And, you know, it, it hasn't changed. Many years ago, Christians would tell other um, 
people that they were witnessing to that, hey, God has a plan for your life. And, you know, I heard that. And I used to think, hey, what in the world is God? You know, who is this God? He has a plan for my life. I got it all figured out. And the thing is, uh, we thought that we had it all figured out, but God really had plans for good, plans for our, our, our welfare, plans for a hope. And I think that hope we have, that hope we have laid up for us in heaven, that hope we have in Jesus Christ, the hope uh, we have that, hey, one day we're going to be with him for all eternity. Here we are ministering and walking in this world, and God desires to bless us and use us to the furtherance of his kingdom. He desires that we might encourage one another to love and good deeds. He desires that we might be uh, his agents in this world. Uh, that uh, many are lost and dying without the love of the Lord. And they're, they're the ones that at times they're very much certain of themselves and they're certain that they have plans and they, they, they're certain they, have, they can trust in their riches or their wealth or their strength or their mindset, whatever it might be. But God really does have plans for our life. Here in chapter 4, he says in verse 1, Moses answered the Lord and he said, What if they will not believe me or listen uh, to what I say? For uh, they may say the Lord has not appeared to you. You know, And he's really arguing with the Lord because the Lord is saying, Hey, go to your brothers and sisters. Go to the Israelites and tell them that the Lord has appeared to you and tell them I got a plan. But uh, Moses, uh, Moses answers the Lord and how many times we have answered in that same manner, but, but God. But Lord, you know, there's always that three-letter word, but. And it's like you're giving a rebuttal. And how can you think that, hey, we're telling God, hey, but God, I don't believe you. But God, I don't trust you. But Lord, uh, uh, our own resistance, guys, and oh, that they'll never do it. Oh, it can't happen. Oh, it's got to be my way because I don't believe you can do it. It's really the answer. I don't believe it. You know, a guy, guys tell me that, hey, why don't you pray? Why don't you try and see what the Lord has? And they say, oh, God's never going to do it. And, you know, it's, sometimes it's the most, uh, it's the oldest Christians that, that say, oh, God's not going to do it. I know. And you, you think that, wow, how can we shut God out from accomplishing the impossible? With men, uh, these, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. Guys, uh, here in two, he goes on. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground. It became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it. And it became a staff in his hand. And they may believe that the Lord, that they may believe the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And the Lord furthermore said to him, Now put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom, and when, uh, when he took it out, uh, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And then he said, Put your hand into your bosom again. He put his hand into his bosom again. When he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Uh, the Lord does a series of signs to con con convince Moses uh, because he's so stuck on the thought, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Can you identify with that? At times we just say, Lord, I know I, I, I should believe. Lord, I know I should trust. But in the back of your mind, there's always that thought, it's never going to happen. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's where Moses was at. That's where we were at at times. And I think that, you know, those are the times we really just got to come, whether it's day by day, moment by moment, minute by minute. We got to give it over to God and say, God, help me in my unbelief. Even as in, in the Gospels, uh, the uh, uh, unbelieving people told Jesus, hey, help me, God, in my unbelief. Because I know with things, all things are possible. With you, all things are possible. As a matter of fact, you know, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, as we pray for people, as people come and bring situations into your life, you really think that, Lord, I'm going to pray, but wow, this is tough. Lord, uh, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's so such a difficult situation and you commit it to God and you begin to pray and you begin to say, Lord, help me believe that you can move and you can minister 
in this particular thing and you know all of us out of the out of the blue god answers in ways that we never thought we imagined and and we think that why didn't i think of that lord because <laughs> but god just uh, reveals himself in the midst of our own unbelief as we pray for people we think that man this is so difficult and yet god moves and god answers in ways that we could never think we imagine the lord does a series of signs to convince moses because he's so stuck on the thought it's never going to happen just like how we are and god gives us these little signs these answer to prayer and says that hey russell believe me frank believe me i'm moving in your midst i'm moving on behalf of your loved ones of your friends who you're praying for and it's it's not only because they're the tough nuts or they're the hard cases but I'm moving in ways that you cannot think or imagine. We just can't see it happening. It seems so impossible. We pray and we really think it's hopeless. Then God answers most of the times again in ways that we could never think. God moves in spite of our lack of faith and belief at times. We lack that and we, we got to say, hey, God, help me in my unbelief. Help me in my unbelief because you know, uh, in, in the flesh, we really have so much doubt and we really have so much fear because, you know, we fear for the situation. We fear for the person going through that. We feel bad. But, you know, we, we think, God, how, how is it? Uh, how are you going to move in this impossible situation? Because in our own puny minds, we think it's impossible. He goes on in verse 9, But it shall, be, uh, it shall be that if they do not believe you, even these two signs or heed what you say, then uh, you shall take some of the water from the Nile and pour it out onto dry ground. And the water which uh, you take from the Nile we b will become blood on the dry ground. The Lord intimates that he will do a series of signs or attesting miracles to try and convince the Egyptians, hey, let my people go. They had been in bondage for 400 years in servitude, and the, 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 the Israelis had been crying out to God. They were moaning. <coughs> they were groaning. <coughs> and I think that at times, you know, as we, we maybe we've moaned and we've groaned to God, because we were wallowing around stuck in sin and God heard us and rescued us and he threw us a lifeline. He threw us a lifeline of hope. He threw us a lifeline that says, hey, I love you. I, he threw out a lifeline that says, I love you. And, you know, grab onto the lifeline, hang on to it. I want to rescue uh, you from this situation. And uh, God heard their cry. And, you know, even for we as believers, guys, you know, at times we... God intercedes on our behalf with groanings that are too deep. You know, Paul wrote that in the, the book of Romans. He says that sometimes we so filled with grief or we so filled with, uh, uh, with, um, with hard times and the hardships that we go through, others are going through, we groan and the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. And, you know, it's like uh, we just moan, we just groan, and God hears those groans and receives them. As prayers and he understands what we're groaning and he understands what we're going through and the feelings and the thoughts and uh, you know that's how great our God is in verse 10 then Moses said to the Lord please Lord I have never been eloquent neither have I recently nor in the past nor since thou hast spoken uh, to thy servant for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue and the Lord said to him who has made man's mouth or who has made him deaf or dumb or seeing or blind is it not I the Lord now go and even uh, and I even I will be with you your mouth will teach you uh, uh, and teach you what you are to say and he said please Lord now send the messenger the message by whomever thou wilt and uh, but again he said and then the anger of the Lord burned verse 14 against Moses he said is there uh, there not your is not there not your brother Aaron the Levite and I know that he speaks fluently and moreover behold he is coming out to meet you uh, when he sees you he will be glad in his heart and you are to speak to him and put uh, and put the words in his mouth and I even I will be with your mouth and his mouth and I will teach you what you shall do moreover he will speak to you he will speak for you to the people and it shall come about that he shall be as a mouth for you and you 
and you shall be as God to him. You shall take a you shall take in your hand this staff with you, which is uh, with which you shall perform the signs. Moses again begs off, guys. And he says, hey, Lord, but Lord, anybody, you know, I've never been a, a speech maker. I've never been fluid in my speech. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just can't do it. And uh, again, he begs off telling the Lord, not uh, really making excuses why he can't or why he shouldn't be used. And you know, I think much of uh, much of the time, like ourselves, we beg off from the Lord. We make ex uh, we make excuses. We give reasons, and they're really excuses why we can't be used. Oh, I don't have the time. Oh, I don't have the talent. I don't have the ability. I can't speak. I can't do. I don't know anything about audio visual. I don't know anything about music. I don't know anything about this or that. Of course, there are those who are polished and there are those who are very articulate. They have a way of speaking or conveying the message which seems very conducive. If you look at some of these preachers on TV, some of them, they sparkle. They're you know, they look so good in their, you know, thousand dollar suits and their polished uh, teeth and their their uh, uh, perfect hair and all that. And, you know, they, they speak very well. They have a way of speaking or conveying the message which seems more conducive, very attractive to the people. But whether the message, the message uh, is really uh, being spoken through the messenger of God, you know, God is not looking at how you look or how you speak or how you sound but he's really looking at what uh, the willingness of that messenger or the willingness of the servant to be used from the Lord but even as Moses tells the Lord in verse 13 please Lord now send the message by whoever thou wilt but he's really adding except me send, send him by any, anyway except me I don't want to do it Lord, I can't do it. Well, the Lord relents and he allows uh, Aaron to be a part of the ministry. The Lord even set it up to where Aaron was on his way to meet Moses. Isn't God so good? Sometimes he just places uh, people in the divine times, in the divine places. And you might uh, be, you might, uh, be uh, held up in traffic. You might be held up doing something. And all of a sudden, the meeting is just, just happens. The meeting of another brother, the meeting that just goes on that says, wow, God, your timing is impeccable. Your timing is perfect. Uh, the word is perfect. Your timing is impeccable. And really, uh, 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 Aaron is already on his way to meet him. He, the Lord adds in verse 15, I will teach you what you are to do. You know, uh, there's a lot of wills. And there's a lot of God's part where he says, I will do this, I will do that, I will teach you, I will speak through you. The Lord will lead these men, he will equip, he will empower them to accomplish his will. And whatever God is calling you, you know, um, you know, it might be cleaning out the gutter. You know, we used to clean out the gutter in front of the old theater early on Sunday morning, sweep out the gutter. And I remember uh, Gerard, uh, Pastor Gerard from T Tahiti, you know, he would be sweeping out the gutter early Sunday morning along the Umanu Avenue. And all oh, the, the love, all the care, you know, of just the little things, the faithfulness. And, uh, uh, you know, when we think about, you know, our guys who have gone before us, Pastor Chuck picking up cigarette butts on the campus, at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and Pastor Bill outside on the building, painting the building on scaffolding and so on and so forth. And, you know, you think of Pastor Ed pushing the vacuum cleaner, uh, exhausted after the How to Walk conferences and so on and so forth. But, you know, God is, uh, uh, God is saying that I will empower you to, to accomplish my will in whatever I call you to do, in the little things, and in the big things. But, you know, you've got to be uh, doing the things of uh, uh, saying that, hey, I, I can take the little baby steps. And even as the, the prophet says, hey, you know, we, we, we want to be faithful in those little things. You know, uh, uh, Verse 17, you shall take the, in your hand this staff, which uh, with you you shall perform the signs. The staff was representative of the Lord's authority and power and might that he was placing within the hands of Moses. You know what that word ordain is? You know when they talk about ordaining the priests in the Old Testament? 
It's that word ordain just literally means to fill the hands. And even as Moses' hands were filled with his staff, the priests in the Old Testament times, their hands were filled with the ordination, their hands placed to the work of God, no matter what it was, you know, how mean, uh, menial or how obscure, how great or how small the task was, God filled their hands with the work. Verse 18, then Moses departed, returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go, that I might return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. You know, I got to believe this guy Jethro was some guy, you know, and uh, he just simply says, uh, as Moses came to him and lays out the, the things on his heart, let me go and return to my brethren in Egypt. And, and you know, Jethro simply does this. He blesses him, saying, go in peace, and he sends him on his way. No long things. And uh, sometimes, you know, we, as we leave people, as we greet people, you know, we might want to bless them with a simple blessing of the Lord. And, you know, uh, you know, maybe uh, it's not too common that people say, hey, God bless you, man. Hey, have a great day or have a blessed day, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, and, and sincerely think that, hey, may God really bless you, man. May God really bless you during this uh, holiday season. May God really bless you as we turn the corner into 2021. He says, now the Lord said to uh, Moses and Midian, uh, go back to Egypt for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. And Moses took uh, his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Moses took the staff of God in his hand, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put uh, in your power, but I will harden his heart so he will not let the people go. And then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, uh, uh, let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And, you know, he lays it out quite eloquently, and it's kind of a big thing. But Moses sets out. The Lord reveals to him more and more. The book is not finished. God gives in increments to Moses uh, what what will take place, what will happen, what he is to say, his meetings, even with the Pharaoh. It's a walk of faith incrementally. The Lord reveals more and more of his plans, his purposes, and instructions. You know, when God calls us to, uh, uh, to come and follow after him, he doesn't give us the entire playbook. He doesn't say that this is going to happen, that is going to happen, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But it's a walk of faith. In faith, we step out in him. In faith, we say, Lord, I'm moving ahead in you. Lord, I'm seeking after you. Lord, I'm following after you. I'm trusting that every step of the way, uh, you know, you, you, you're going to give me a little bit more of the insight, a little bit more of the plan, a little bit more direction. You know, God, Jesus said, hey, knock and seek. You know, and uh, whatever that knocking and seeking says, you know, God, uh, uh, open one door, close another door. Lord, lead me, you know, uh, in the way that we would go. And again, uh, it's a walk of faith incrementally. We can't just sit there. You know, if you sit there, it's hard for anything to really happen. I mean, at times we sit there and, man, uh, we expect lightning to strike. It doesn't strike, but as we step out in faith, as we move in Him, He's the one faithful to close the wrong doors, to open the, the right doors. He's the one to give us a little bit of uh, experimenting to see this or that. And He'll lead us uh, in those things. But we got to do our part. we got to be moving out in the things of the Lord. Uh, not just stop in part, not going anywhere, not going doing anything. For us, we, we, uh, we aren't sure of how it will all come down. You know, we're not sure of that. And uh, uh, it's day by day we walk in faith, we trust uh, and trust uh, in, in our Lord, uh, especially in those times of questions. And I don't know about you guys, at times i got a lot of questions. How are we going to make it? How are we going to survive? How are we going to do this? How are we going to juggle all these kids around or whatever it might be? How are we going to do it? How are they going to do it? Hey, Lord, how how go, how we do it, Lord? How do we do it? <laughs> and you just don't know. 
And God is the faithful one, and we go trusting Him. We go believing that He's the, uh, He is the rewarder of those who seek Him. I love that verse out of Hebrews. It came about the lodging place on uh, 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 twenty-four, and on the way to the that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took out a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet, and she said, "You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me." And uh, so she, she, uh, he let him alone. And that time uh, she said, you are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Uh, this is a hard saying, guys. This verse is hard. And, you know, I looked at it time and time again as we were coming up to the study. And I said, wow, the Lord wanted to kill Moses. Uh, uh, why would the Lord seek to put his uh, servant to death? The NIV has a little footnote saying that, it wasn't Moses he was going to put to death, but put to death his first son, his firstborn son. But however you want to look at it, guys, perhaps this death, like baptism, was a putting away or putting to death the old man. And again, it's a speaking like baptism when you're laid out in that water. It's like burying that old man and being raised again in that newness of life in Christ Jesus. It's like saying, I, I'm dead to the old self. I'm dead to the old man. I'm alive now in uh, Christ Jesus. I don't know about if you guys have all been baptized or baptized as kids or whatever it was, but I, I was baptized in a pool up at Wailaiki on a midweek service just like this, you know, and uh, dunked in the pool of water. And it really seemed like that was a turning point in my life. That even though I didn't really understand it, I really didn't fathom it. Yeah, I read Romans 6, like everybody said, read Romans 6. But it was like a turning point. It was like truly the old man had been put away in death. And yeah, I had the struggles, even in the newness of life. But uh, it was like moving on. There was no turning back after that. I marked that. I hallmarked that in, uh, uh, in my one of my my very first Bible actually is that the turning point uh, uh, in my life and really my spiritual rebirth uh, putting to death the old man in all the fleshly doubt and all the mistrust to accomplish God's uh, task meant a putting away of the old man and putting on the new you cannot you cannot uh, try and do it in the old things of the flesh in the oldness of the dirty stinky rotting flesh you know and I, I like somehow some of these guys put it you know like uh, Don McClure the way they talk about the old stinky body and uh, so on and so forth but it's really a putting away of the old man putting on the new and uh, we, we see the rite of circumcision now uh, reinstituted, uh, reinstituted starting uh, starting with uh, um, uh, Moses' son a cutting not so much of the flesh but of the heart. You know, in, the, in, in those times, many of the pagan people, they didn't believe in circumcision. But circumcision really says that, hey, we're something different. We are people set apart for the Lord. We've cut away this part of the flesh, the very most precious part of a man's body. It's been cut away saying that, hey, we set apart for God. We set apart in the shedding of this blood. We set apart... Uh, um, uh, from the things of the world and the flesh and the devil. And, you know, Jeremiah said it rightly. He says, hey, don't circumcise the flesh, but circumcise the hardness of your heart. Because even uh, believers, even Christians, they can get real hard-hearted at times. They can make up their mind and say, hey, I'm, I, I, I ain't doing this. It's not happening. It's impossible. Whatever it might be. God is so good, uh, you know, in his... Uh, uh, his system. But uh, 27, the Lord said to Moses, go to meet Moses. Uh, the Lord said to Aaron, uh, go and meet Moses in the wilderness. So he went to meet him at the mountain of God and he kissed him. And Moses said to Aaron, uh, all the words the Lord with which he had sent him and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Uh, like, like God is so good, guys, to even have a welcoming reception for Moses. Remember earlier in the chapel, he told uh, he told Moses that hey, Aaron is already on his way. 
And now he's telling Aaron, hey, go meet your brother Moses because he's coming. God is so good to have that welcoming committee for Moses. Aaron is sent by the Lord to meet him at the appointed place and then fill in for him God's instruction uh, to him, God's plans, God's purposes. Uh, 29, he goes on, and Moses went, uh, Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. Guys, like missionaries, the team of two men uh, went out to go share with the elders of Israel. Now these men, you know, these elders, I want to believe that they were godly men who anticipated God would move on their behalf. You know, there's always a remnant that the Bible speaks of. You know, in the Old Testament times, there was always that remnant. And I got to look into this, this little verse that these men went as messengers of God to share with the elders of Israel who had been waiting and hoping to see what God would do on their behalf, the children of Israel, as they prayed, as they recalled the things of their forefathers. I want to believe that these godly men who anticipated God would move and minister on their behalf. Like we mentioned Sunday morning in 1 Peter, persecution or hard times could either foster growth in the life of the believer or bring an attitude of bitterness. Hard times can either bring growth, foster growth in the life of the believer, or bring an attitude or a heartfelt bitterness to what goes on. Broke my heart, I met a, a person that says, I don't believe in God no more. My son's going through a hard time. I, I'm tired, I don't sleep, and I don't believe, I don't pray no more. And I said, oh man. You know, I, I don't know where she was at with the Lord, but at one time I know she was praying through that situation. And, and yet all the things of the hard times had fostered, fostered uh, uh, in her life an attitude of bitterness. And, you know, it just broke my heart. And, uh, but I can, I can believe, I can pray for that family and say, God, you can move, you can minister in ways that we cannot think we imagine because you've done so many miracles in my life uh, quite just so recently. But the Lord, uh, uh, the Lord, uh, and Aaron spoke to all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses were sturdy, and he performed the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed, and they heard the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel. He had seen their affliction. Then they bowed low and worshipped. Isn't that a great thing, guys, that uh, you, you find out that hey, somebody does care? You think that, you know, at times you think nobody cares, you know. Nobody calls, nobody cares, and but God cares, and... Uh, Moses would confirm the word of the Lord as a witness of God being in the midst of the work. In their hearts, they received and believed God's concern for their lives. And uh, in, uh, in this, they bowed low in worship. Guys, you know, we don't bow low on the ground. We don't kneel on the ground here at the chapel. You might kneel by your bedside at home. I'm not sure. But that worship... Uh, uh, really says and being humble just says that hey, I take that pl lowly place and I bow before the Lord in, in humble worship and the worship the word worship again in the New Testament language just simply means to kiss towards we kiss towards the Lord in worship and it really it becomes not so much an attitude of a position of the body but it comes uh, to be an attitude of the heart for us and in this, uh, I think that we have great hope. In all this, we think that, wow, this is a hopeless situation. We got this COVID, we got this unemployment, we got people depressed around us and all this and that. And yet, I, I think that uh, here we see uh, they, they heard the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel. And we can think that, wow, God, you so, you're concerned about us. You're concerned about our loved ones. You're concerned about those we're praying for. God, you're so good. You know, you know all things, and you desire good things for people. And that's God's heart, guys. And uh, at times we can get so funky because we believe that God doesn't care. We get so funky that it's impossible. It's hopeless. I'm sorry. You know, but, you know, it, it, with, with uh, 
With men, it's really impossible. With God, all things are possible. Let's pray. Father God, we do want to thank you, Lord. And we thank you for the message of hope that you always give, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that as we turn the corner and look down the road into 2021, we look forward with great uh, anticipation and great anxiousness uh, to see what you have and what you will do and what you will accomplish in the midst of your people, Father God. And we entrust our hearts and lives to you afresh, Lord. We entrust your work uh, uh, to you, Lord. And may we be as those, uh, uh, not hardened pieces of clay, but Lord, clay, pieces of clay that are flexible, that are moldable, that are shapeable, Lord, and to vessels fit for your use, vessels fit to bring honor and glory to your name. We thank you, Lord, again for the promises we have in your word and the great anticipation we have in the hope and the love of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.